like the sound of a symphony to my ears, like holy water on my skin. I don't want to be your guest, God, I need it every day. The only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to be your guest. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy water, your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound. Welcome to church this morning. Hey, we want to just acknowledge a couple wonderful things. And one is Nick and Eva. Ava? Neva. Neva, where are you? Oh, my goodness. These two just got engaged yesterday? Woo! Yesterday. Woo! Nick and Neva, congratulations to you. Also, we have a 50th anniversary we want to say happy anniversary to tony and maria cadena 50 years that's um very 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 special so a couple quick things right after church um all those that are part of first impressions do you know what that is first impressions it's the first impression somebody gets when they walk in the door. And those groups are greeters, ushers, welcome center, hospitality, and security. So if you are part of that or you would like to be, if you are just interested in checking it out, right after service, I've got two soup options, some great bread, some salad, cookies. We're going to meet right back in the Second Children's Church room. So right after church, and we're going to do some training. I've got some great videos, so make sure you make it back for that. And two weeks, it is Everything Apple Fall Festival Celebration. So I know some of you are already practicing your recipes. Let's see, did we have the trophy? Um, okay, so there's a wonderful trophy. It's already engraved with the champion, number one Northwest Community Church. So anything with apples. We're going to have some games in the foyer. The coffee shop will be up with some special apple caramel type drinks. So we're going to have fun. It is a time to bring someone. Bring something, apple food, and bring people. So it's going to be a good time, right? And get ready. Daylight savings time is coming up around the corner. Yeah, we'll let you know when that is happening. So we have missionaries that are sharing today. We have uh, communion, and we've got the Word of God. It's going to be so rich. Father, we invite you right now. Holy Spirit, come and just sweep through this place. Rest on each person. Whatever they've brought in to church um, from what has been going on this last week, Whatever you're experiencing, they know it's going to come this week. I pray right now that we could just put all of that aside, everything aside, and we could just focus on you. Thank you, Jesus. Move in your name. Amen. Let's worship. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything you need, you got. There's honey in
share in communion here in just a moment, you can go ahead and be seated. I love the words of that song, in the caverns of my soul. Do you ever feel like you've got a cavern? There's something deep in your soul that's longing. Are you guys longing for more of the spirit of the living God? I just find that song absolutely the perfect song to prepare for the communion table. We have to get our minds and our hearts aligned. We are now going to remember what Christ did for us. Not 2,000 years ago just, but up to today, what Christ did for you and I. I don't know about you, but when you get as old as I am, um, memory becomes more of an issue. And I am learning to take notes more wherever I go. Uh, when you tell me something on Sunday morning, I'll often say, oh my, could you text me that? Because I'll never remember, right? Memory is an interesting thing. We remember special events. Um, like my mother, she remembers things long ago, but doesn't remember things so much in the recent. Well, I want to just share with you a little bit as we remember communion. The Lord knows how short our memories are. He gets it. So throughout the Bible, we find Jesus reminding us of things again and again. When we're preaching, you may say, you know what, I've heard that before. It's like, yep. Um, we're going to keep telling you the same thing because we forget. We forget. That's a tool of the enemy. So he reminds us in the word again and again and even doing things to help us remember. This is what some of the things in scripture he gives us to remember. We have memorial offerings. That was in the, in the word. Writings, um, tassels. If you ever, we'll talk about Israel in a little bit, but... You know, the tassels in the Old Testament, they still wear them around Israel. And that is to remember many things of Scripture. There are rainbows. The rainbow God gave, by the way. And he gave it to us to remember that he will uh, care for us. And he will never flood the earth and destroy. Books and Scripture, stacked stones, those were given to remember. Jesus used parables and items around him in those parables. Whether he wrote in the stand or he had sticks or whatever. He used things like this to help people remember what he taught. So we come to communion this morning. We have it the second Sunday of every month. But we can just get used to it and not even think about what it means. So the, this morning the Holy Spirit is saying, oh no, no, don't. Don't take of the offering without remembering. So if, if you're like in a zone and you're like, I don't, I don't know who Jesus is, I'm, I'm calling you back right now. I'm calling you back to remember. The whole Bible, there is no more important reminder. There is nothing more significant than in, in remembering, giving us reminders than what he established in the Last Supper. It reminds us of his crucifixion. It is communion, the memorial meal. You go to a memorial wall and you remember. This is our memorial, right? So I'm going to pray over you. But I want you to pray inside that right now you have that connection with the Lord, that you can shut everything else out and you will remember right now even if you've heard it a thousand times, I want you to remember right now, Jesus Christ died on the cross. Brutal death. That wasn't even the big thing. The big thing of that moment was he took your sin. Every stupid thing, every embarrassing, shameful thing, he took it. And then the blood that was shed and his resurrection erased it. That's what we're remembering. And it's promised to return. Jesus, I pray right now that in this moment, there would be conversations happening throughout this room and online. All the online audience, that they too 
would be having a conversation with you. That right now we would be saying, Jesus, I shut everything else out. If, if you've been living in sin, right now repent. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for the distance that I've allowed to come between you and I. You're coming soon. I want to make things right. I want to live for you. Time is short. So, Father, I come into your presence right now, and I remember, Jesus, what you've done, that you were beaten and you were crucified for me. You took my sin, but you rose again. Jesus, make that real for every person in this moment, I pray. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this song, and we're going to pass out the elements, and I'm going to ask you to hold them. We'll partake together. If you know Jesus, you're invited to take. I don't care what church you're a part of. It doesn't matter to me. If you know Jesus, let's share the meal together, okay?
If you lift the upper part, your cracker is in the bottom. So if you would take that out first and get your cracker ready, hold on to your juice. And let's read. Once again, we read usually whoops, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it says that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember together. Praise you, Jesus. Maybe you could just shout out a praise. Thank him for what he's done. Think if he didn't do it for you. Thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to be beaten and torn apart for me, for us. Oh, God, you are so good. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember together. Father, much about what you did on the cross was our spiritual healing. But it says, by your stripes we are healed. And in that, Father, we come to you with physical needs. We're in this church. Right now there are some critical, critical needs. And I thank you that you don't tire of us bringing them to you and that you have compassion on these people. Jesus, right now, Donna Baker here in this service, I thank you that she's here. Father God, I pray that you would heal her. I ask that you would pour out healing on her. God, you use her life in so many ways through this through Dykeman's Bible bookstore. And for years, her testimony in her light has shown in this uh, Tacoma area. God, I pray that you would touch her body and you would rip out the cancer. Jesus, I ask, bring strength and comfort to her family and to her. Father, we bring Lauren Fatalia to you, who's going to have surgery on Wednesday. I pray, Father, that her light will shine in that operating room. That everybody who's working on her will go, wow, that woman is in touch with the living God. Jesus, I pray that you would guide the surgeon's hands and that it would all go well. She would recover quickly and that there would be no pain. Just touch her, go before her, I pray. Lord, for John and Beth Sortson, who are home sick and this ripping cold and in sinus infection and bronchitis and whatever it is. Jesus, I pray that you would be with them. I know they're watching online right now. God, I pray that they would know we love them as a church and that you would touch them and heal them, keep them. Lord, we know John is facing surgery supposedly this week, a biopsy. God, I pray that they would both be well enough that he could take that uh, spot in the uh, operating room and it doesn't have to be delayed but we will trust you your timing but Jesus just fill their home this morning I pray and father all of us um, watch the news we've seen the war that's broken out in your holy city in your holy country Jesus we pray right now for Israel I pray, Jesus, for peace in Jerusalem. Your word tells us, pray for peace. God, it just seems like all around the globe right now, there's just countries who are on the cusp of war. And then Israel in a full-on war. God, I pray that people will find you first and foremost, that your church would grow in the midst of, of this horror and this terrorism. Jesus, we pray that the believers will be protected. For the families, the children, the men, the women that have been abducted and are being held as hostage, we pray that they would reach out, they would cry out to a living God, the God of their heritage, and that you would meet them. Oh, Jesus, we pray. All these things we ask in your mighty and precious name. Amen.
Keep praying for those situations. Don't stop. And the ushers are going to come, and they're going to pick up your cups. As they are doing that, I am going to invite the horns to join me on stage. I need to find what I just did with my notes. Um, This is the Horn family. Come on up here. Um, this, they are friends. We met them through the Hemmings. Um, it is, um, it's Louis and Elizabeth. Come on up and um, we will take that uh, microphone right there for you. And they are part of the International Four Square Church that we are a part of, our church. Um, and these guys have just gone out into the mission field. I think we're looking for a, there's husband, Louis. Yes, come on stage, no problem. There you go. Why don't you guys, yeah, you'll stand cool. together. Oh, so to these that. guys are um, incredible. I, I had the wonderful opportunity to spend a couple hours with you yeah. um, around uh, lunch, and it was fabulous. You just came right into my heart. Um, and your kids, do you, can you pop up here a second? We got to meet them, and then you can go back. Uh, they're busy people. We, we have another. We have another one in the back. That's where I was because he was. Oh, the, oh, getting settled into children's church. Yes. Okay. Do you want to introduce your kids? Yes. Yeah, so this is our our eldest. This is Zoe. This is Mateo, who turned six in two days. Uh, very exciting. And then Nathaniel, he's around. Oh, here he comes. Oh, Nathaniel, Daniel's on his way. Nathaniel's on his way, and he turns four actually tomorrow. Wow, which is birthday week. Yes, so all this is awesome. And this is Hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Na- Na- Nathaniel. No, Nathaniel. Hello, Nathaniel. And then this littlest one here is Alexander. Alexander. So we have a, Wow, you are busy. My quibbler's full. Well, yes. thank you guys for coming to the stage. You can yeah, go ahead and back to be seated, but we just wanted to meet the whole family. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to them for a few minutes. They've got some slides, but I want you to have an open heart and open mind to where their mission field is. You guys go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Th- thank you so much, Pastor Mary. Thank you, church family, for giving us this opportunity to, to share with you all who we are, what we're doing, and how we're, we're serving Yakima Nation. Um, I think it was really important for us to go ahead and introduce the family uh, to you all because, one, yeah, it's cool to see, okay, what other kids are, are, are coming along in this, but also just as important is that it's not Elizabeth and Luis on the mission field. It's Elizabeth, Luis, Zoe, Mateo, Nathaniel, and Alexander on the mission field as missionaries. And that's very important because it is the whole family that is out there serving Yakima Nation, and it's just not, not us to... Uh, uh, doing it. <coughs> so with that, my, my wife will, will share here. Oh, well, for, um, oh, they have the PowerPoint over there, so don't need it on my phone. Um, we are FMI workers, that uh, formerly missionaries, they called workers now, but um, we're at Yakima Nation, which um, hopefully everyone know has heard Yakima, Washington. There is a reservation um, <clears throat> just outside of the city of Yakima. I have a map um, on my slide, but it's a pretty uh, big chunk of Washington, but many people don't know it exists. It does. It's got about 10,800 enrolled wow. members, and we um, felt God call us to the native people about um, three years now, and so it was about a year and a half process, but God moved us from Tacoma to um, Yakima Nation, and we've been there about two years now. So um, we uh, love it, and it's been a whirlwind, but <coughs> we went as missions workers because um, a reservation is so different than our normal um, Western United States um, environment, and so <coughs> it, we felt it important to go with FMI, and so it's been um, good. We are two of four total FMI workers assigned to reservations in the United States. Wow. Um, So it is um, a a ripe place for missions work, and um, we're just thrilled to be part of it. And 
um, the Hemming boys, Roman and Judah, are working with our friends Yaz and Mo, who are the other two um, missions workers. They work with all tribes in the United States, uh, enabling leaders, but Roman and Judah are there helping serve their young adults camp this weekend, so that's super exciting to see that relationship. But um, I have a few just kind of realities of what we face on the reservation, and it's, um, I don't want to paint a, a negative picture of the reservation because it's beautiful. I have, we have Mount Adams in our background um, every day, and I have a few pictures on the next slide if you wanna go to that. Um, the people are beautiful, their culture is beautiful, um, but the reality is reservations are challenging. And the, the, mm -hmm. the damage that's been done to native people in the United States has consequences and ramifications that we see to this day. And it's often was done in the name of God. And though we're not maybe ourselves individually responsible, but there are consequences of those actions that happen, you know, 150, 200 years ago that play out yeah. in broken families and a substance addiction and violence in poverty, um, in isolation. We're in a very rural community and um, rural poverty is very different than urban poverty. Um, sometimes it seems even worse because they don't have access to resources and you see it play out in the kids and it's devastating. But um, <clears throat> about 0.4% of Natives living on reservations in the United States as a whole have a robust relationship with God. So um, that's not specific to our reservation, but it's, you know, the national average, and that's very small. So if 10,000 people are enrolled, the at national average would say that there's about 40 believers in that context. And so we're working in a very unreached group. 99.2% um, of the children live in poverty. Luis is a teacher and he sees this firsthand on the reservation. One in three students are homeless. Um, mm. Deep poverty, which is if you're making six times, um, or it's six times higher on reservations, so that's, uh, I think it's like 4% lower than the poverty line. Um, suicide rates are higher in Native Americans. Um, three times, in fact, than the national average. Um, they are four times more likely to die by drug and alcohol addiction than the average. Uh, teen drug use is two times higher than the national average, and four out of five women have experienced or will experience violence in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so these are very real problems that we see every day on the reservation and we know that God's called us there to bring Jesus so that they can experience the freedom that he has for them. And um, I'll let Louise share a little bit about our vision of what we see on the reservation, but we're, we're just honored that God has called us to, to this group of people. Yeah, I got it. <clears throat> so for, for us, our vision is to contextualize the gospel for the Yakima people in order for them to experience the full restoration Jesus has for them by making disciples of Jesus. And so in, in my classrooms, um, I see or I have students actually ask me questions about Jesus, right, or about Christianity. And a lot of them, they have this warped view of who Jesus and Christianity is because mm -hmm. of what they've been told or what they've been seen. And so for us, it is very important that we are one, speaking the truth, but then also showing them how Jesus is in many parts of, of their culture, right? How, how does this play out? Um, we also are very much focused on identifying and developing these, these indigenous leaders, right, who are going to respond to God's life, uh, God's call in their life. Um, we are partnering with, with a, a, at times, partner with another ministry out there where they're focused on the uh, business as ministry, and we are much more obviously on the spiritual side. And there are plans for us to come alongside them in that area where as they're developing these students in their uh, working environment, showing them these skills that we then come alongside these students who are, 
questioning, who are wondering, who are seeking the Lord, and, and in a way we are becoming their uh, disciples, showing them who Jesus is and developing them as individuals and as followers of Jesus, because our ultimate uh, uh, hope is that they then would go ahead and plant churches in their community. So it's them who are doing the uh, church planting. It's them creating these churches that are very distinctly Yakma, not necessarily how we see church here, uh, expressed here. And then with even the further hope is that they then too would become missionaries to maybe other tribes or uh, other countries around the world. So for us, that, those are the, the two, two, three really important things for us. And then the last is this reconciliation between us as Christians and the Yakima people. Mm. Um, we've seen it, I've seen it firsthand in the things that, they, that my students uh, tell me, the community tells me about the damage and harm that's been done. And when they find out through the grapevine that, that myself and my wife, that, that we are believers, it begins to change the perspective of what that means to be a follower of Jesus, mm. what it means to be a Christian, because here it is, they see me loving, caring, and, and speaking life into them every single day, and it's completely the opposite of what they're accustomed to. So, so for us, that is also another very uh, important thing here. And then the, the, the next thing we want to talk to you about um, is, is partnership. So for us, we, we can't do this alone, right? This being on the reservation is, is as we've talked about, is, is very challenging. We have our vision that we've, we've discussed. We are two of four people in, in all of Four Square who are serving the reservations throughout the nation. And we need partners. And the, the way that looks out is, is, is three different things, right? The first one is we need you all to sign up for our newsletter. And the reason for that is so that we, wh that way you know what is going on, what is going in, in our lives as, as, as four square workers, what's going on uh, in, in Yakima Nation. Um, currently, right now, we are finishing up our six weeks of prayer and fasting for Yakima Nation. Uh, every, thir every Friday uh, during our meals, we have specific pr uh, prayer points that we focus on and that we ask for people to pray and inter intercede for. Mm -hmm. um, and so please, we'll be out there. Please sign up for that. Um, the second thing is prayer. For me, for us, prayer is going to be the most significant thing any of us ever do, right? Because the reality is being on the reservation, there are spiritual attacks that, that, that we have already gone through multiple times. There has been instances where I have had a, a student come up to me, shake, his, shake my hand, and going, hey, I am giving you bad medicine. And for those of you who don't know what bad medicine is, in, in other words, he's saying that I'm cursing you right now. And when I'm asking him, what does that mean? He goes, my spirit is beating your spirit. Okay, what do you mean by that? It doesn't make sense. Well, have you ever gone without food and water for three days? Have you ever uh, uh, danced for four hours at, at a powwow? Have you, uh, you know, all those, have you ever uh, uh, pulled buffalo skulls behind you as your skin's been pierced, right? And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, no, but do you know who my God is? Like, that's, that, that does not scare me. But still, we need prayer, prayer for health, prayer for um, uh, uh, protection, prayer that the Lord would embolden us to continue to proclaim the good news, prayer that people would come alongside us that for relationships, for all these different things. These are the things that, that we desperately need. And the third and final thing is, is, is finances. We need monthly supporters who are going to go, hey, you know, Elizabeth and Luis, we believe in what you are doing. We can't physically be there with you but we believe in what you are doing, and we want to be monthly givers to support what is going on there um, on the mission field, what, what's going on there uh, uh, with Yakima Nation, um, and, and so we want to be a part of that. So those three things, again, sign up for our newsletter, pray for us, right? We need prayer partners, and then please give, right? Give monthly to what we are doing here. And that is all. Awesome. I think with your a couple more slides of pictures that we had missed. Oh, maybe in the beginning. Yeah. Um, I think it's very interesting because my mother grew up on the mission field. and She was born in China. And so all my life I've known missionaries. But we often think of missionaries have to be overseas in, a, in the jungles of Africa or in the heartland of China. Um, and in truth, y you guys, your mission field right here is... Um, it's very complicated and it's very hard to move in there and be part of their culture. So we want to just, we want to pray over you right now as a church. And I'm glad that you are willing to share what God's called you to do 
and your mission, but would you guys extend your hand as we pray over this young family? Father God, we bring the Horn family to you right now. I pray for Louise and Elizabeth and their children. God, first I pray that you would guide them, you would fill them, you would anoint them, equip them as they are dealing with um, an area that is full of the occult and cultish tendencies and spirit worship. And when they come up against demonic forces, I pray that you would fill them with the strength and the power of your spirit because your promise is that you, they overcome. But Lord, for each and every soul that is lost on this Yakima reservation, I pray for revival. I pray that an outpouring would come that these beautiful people who are created at your hand, that they would come to see and accept and know the living God. Set a revival in Washington State and the Yakima Reservation. Put a hedge of protection around this family. We ask God that you would bring provision, partners, Lord, just to meet their financial need as they uh, raise these kids and and. He works as a teacher, but it's not enough. So we want to come in and help. So Jesus be with them. Thank you for them in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. At the close of the service, um, this isn't for your tithes, because if you put your tithes in there, um, I can't pay the rent. So um, please be faithful with your tithes. But um, we are going to, as we go out, Russell, here's a note for you. If you can have one of your ushers hold a bag at the door, as you go out, could you just reach in your pocket and put some bills and some change or write a check or something, but get the address off of their uh, newsletter at the connection, at the welcome booth. Uh, but let's, let's bless them and give. So ushers, come on down. This right now is for our tithes. This is for the Northwest Community Church to keep running and um, do our outreaches and our own mission base here uh, in Lakewood, Tacoma, and the surrounding area. Father, I pray that you would meet uh, every financial need that we have. I pray, God, that um, as people give, you would meet their uh, needs, their financial needs in their homes. But Lord, stir the hearts of all of us that we would give the 10% tithe that, we, uh, that is yours. So bless those who give from little or from much. In your name, amen.
can be seated. That's what we're going to talk about today. That the eyes of our heart would be open. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, so I can see you. I can see this world the way it really is. There was a man who uh, was looked at his windshield, and it was filthy. I mean, there was the bird poop and the bug splatter and everything, and he was having a rough time seeing out. So he was driving in Oregon, so he pulled up the gas station, got some gas, and it's nice. They still have attendants there in Oregon, you know. So he had them go and clean off their windshield, and he pointed out, get that spot, get this spot right here, and the guy would be scrubbing his car. No, get it. He's not getting it. And, and then here's some bug spot. Get that, get that. Get. For crying out loud, do I have to get out and do this myself, he thought? He was going for the handle to get out. And his wife said, honey, before you get out, would you hand me your glasses? And she, <laughs> she cleaned up his glasses, and he put them back on, and that windshield was sparkly clean. <laughs> sparkly clean. See, it was all what he was seeing through his glasses. He was frustrated, he was frustrated with all these people, and they couldn't even clean his windshield. He just had a wrong perspective. But it wasn't the outside world that was wrong. It was him. He was the one who was messed up. Is his view on life. Often that's true with us. Probably more often true than not. That what we go through affects us very, very bad because of our perspective. And the Lord needs to open the eyes of our heart so we can see him. We can grow in him. We see the world as he sees it. It's a, totally, it's a totally different world. It's a totally different world. And that was Paul's prayer for the people of Ephesus. They were going through a rough time. And Paul said, my prayer for you people is that the eyes of your heart would be open so you can see things the way God sees things. You can see this world the way it really, really is. And that's the prayer for Northwest Community Church as well. That's a prayer for you. Open the eyes of my heart to see life the way life really is. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which you have been called, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. So you wouldn't go through life walking in darkness. But the light would be turned on and you would see things the way they really are. As we go through rough times in our life, man, we can feel like we're just on the very bottom. And nothing is right in this world. Our windshield is just splattered. But if we look through the eyes of Jesus and God opens our eyes, man, life looks so, so different. Do you remember Job? Job was a guy who hit the bottom. If you thought you hit the bottom, you thought you had problems, man, read about Job. Job is a guy who had real problems. He hit the very, very bottom in life. Remember his wife, such a helpful person to Job? Just curse God and die. I mean, but what happened in Job's life? After he'd gone through these struggles, he turned to the Lord and the Lord spoke to him. And Job responded to the Lord in this way. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He went through the roughest times of his life, but the eyes of his heart had been opened. Where he had heard about the Lord, he loved the Lord, he was following the Lord, he was even a very righteous man following the Lord, but now... He saw things from a different perspective. He was beginning to see things through God's eyes and seeing how life really, really is. I was driving around last week and I was listening to 6.20 a.m. I know, isn't that, sounds like an exciting thing to do, isn't it? So listen to an a.m. channel and there's a lot of preaching going on in that a.m. channel. But then they have contemporary Christian music now and then on it. Contemporary Christian music from the 70s, <laughs> kind of like an oxymoron there, <laughs> and uh, Keith Green was on, and I, anyone know who Keith Green is? Well, Keith Green was a, quite a man of God, and he died in a plane crash, but he has had such great, wonderful spiritual insights, and this song is entitled, His Love Broke Through, 
And he sings this, like a foolish dreamer trying to build a highway to the sky, all my hopes would come tumbling, tumbling down and I never knew just why. Until today, when you pulled away the clouds that hung like curtains over my eyes. Well, I've been blind all these wasted years and I thought I was so wise. It's like waking up from the longest dream, how real it seemed until your, your love broke through. I've been lost in a fantasy that blinded me until your love broke through. And as I heard those words, you know, I never really understood that chorus. I just kind of sang it. I don't know what it, you know, I was always thinking like following the Lord is a fantasy or, you know. <laughs> now what he's saying is, Without the Lord, without having our spiritual eyes open, living in this world is like living in a long dream. You know all those long dreams where you keep dreaming and dreaming and dreaming, you don't think you'll ever wake up, and it's just so real. You could swear it's real, but it's not. And you wake up and you could say, I could have swore I was doing all those things. See, without God opening your eyes, this world is a fantasy. It's just mythology. They said things that are happening around us are just fantasy. Think of the things that are told of us that just is not true. It's all fantasy. It's not true. See, he knew what the people in Ephesus were going through, and they were going through rough times, and they live in a place where they had many, many, many gods. Talk about a fantasy. Many, 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 many gods. Those are all mythological things. You didn't like the God? You needed a special God? Come on over, talk to someone. They'd create a God for you. They'd get, oh, make a new God for you. What a, a bad dream. What a fantasy. There in Ephesus was the temple of Diana. And she was kind of a sexual God. And uh, they had prostitutes in the temple. So to worship the Lord, you would go and spend time with the prostitutes, if you know what I mean. It was, talk about a fantasy. This is a good thing. It's not only legal, it's virtuous. It's like being in a bad dream. It's just, it's just crazy. Today, you can go into the department store and fill up your cart with $899 worth of stuff and just walk out. And the people who work there will make sure you're not touched. And you can go fill it. Am I in a real world? Is this a dream? That today you can go in and count 800 and 9, if thou shalt not steal, as long as it's over $900. Tom, one of our people here in the church, said he was over Tacoma Mall. And he saw, he saw a Kia being stolen. And just a quarter, less than a quarter of a block away was the police officer. He drove over to him and said, hey, there's a car being stolen right over there. The police officer looked, and he said, okay, thanks, thanks for telling me. Rolled up his window. Because it's, you can't chase someone who's stolen a car. I'm, the, I'm living in a dream, aren't I? It's a fantasy. No, 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 this is true. We live in a, a world where there are countless genders. Jesus, God said there were only two. It's a fantasy. It's not real. It's crazy. It's a bad dream. But then his love breaks through. And you see the Lord. And you see the Lord and you see things through his eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. I want to see things the way you see them. I don't want to live in fantasy and I don't want to be living in a bad dream. But I want to see the Lord's reality. And if you don't have the Lord, and if he doesn't open your spiritual eyes, you can fall into depression really, really quick. Because this world is full of fantasy, crazy stuff. So the first point of today's message, and the main point is, is that we need to pray. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Open my eyes, Lord, so I can see the things that you want me to see. It's interesting, this word... Heart means cardia. Is it sound familiar at all? The heart and the cardia. So it means, you know, the heart is the, the pump that's within you, and it's this, the center of your being, and if this thing stops in your physical body, you stop. 
But it also, back then and today, means this, the core of our spiritual being. The very core of our spiritual being, our heart, our soul, our spirit, our mind. Open those things up in my life so I can see you, Lord. That's what I really need. Do you remember Elisha in the scriptures? Uh, Elisha was being attacked and the army surrounded this town he was in. And there were just hundreds of troops around him. And his servant said, whoa, it's all these guys against us, Elisha. What are we going to do? He said, don't be afraid. Because those who are with us are far greater than those that are around us. And he said, Lord, open his eyes. And the servant's eyes were opened, and he looked up to the mountains, and there were chariots of fire and, and angels beyond number, far greater than those who were there. And the enemy saw them and ran. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. When things look like they're really at the very end, there's, there's no hope. Open the eyes of my heart like you did to that servant. And I can see if God is for me, who can be against me? You're with me, Lord. You're helping me in every way. Psalms 119 says, open my eyes so that I may behold the wondrous things of the law. He, you try to write, uh, read the word and just use your own intelligence and, and so far that... It, you're, you're getting very little of what the scripture is telling you. The Lord needs to open the eyes of your heart. So when you go to the word, Lord, open the eyes of my heart so I understand your word. And not only that I understand it, but I apply it to my life. Luke 24, verse 45 says, Then opened he their understanding so that they could understand the scriptures. I like this one. Paul is quoting Jesus in Acts 26, and he says to the disciples, they were sent to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. Our job as Christians is to go out and open the eyes of other people so they're not living in darkness. They're not living in this fantasy world. They're not living in this bad dream, but they're living in reality. That there is a God in heaven who created us, who loves us, who died for us, and is living, and he, he, he wants the very best for us. One of the things he specifically says about opening the eyes of our heart, that you will see the inheritance that God has for you. God has an inheritance. I often read that, and I think of, well, I'll get my inheritance when I die and go to heaven, right? I don't know why we think that, because what happens is when... The person who's giving you the gift dies. Then you get the inheritance. So the inheritance has already begun. When you accept Christ, you've got the inheritance, and it just continues to grow and grow and grow, and you get more and more. But right now, you have already inherited so much from the Lord. It's an incredible thing. Ephesians 1, 19 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which you are called, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Man, the Ephesians had a wonderful and rich inheritance, and so do we. James chapter 1, verse 16 says this, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights. Don't be deceived. Don't be blinded by this world. That says the things you've got are because you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you go to work and you really work. That is true. There's certainly truth there. But how about the breath that's in your lungs? Uh, how, how do you get that? What have you done to get breath in your lungs? You just, it happens because the Lord has given you a good gift. Who gives you the strength to get up in the morning? It's God. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. Yeah, we do our part. But ultimately, every good thing in our lives come from the Lord Jesus. That's what it's all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, Everything that we have, right thinking, right living, a clean slate, a fresh new start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. 
Man, isn't that great that we get a fresh new start each and every day? Every good thing comes from the Lord. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says about our rewards that we get from the Lord, the benefits we have from Him. If we consider the rewards promised to the, in the Gospels, it would seem that our, old, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with sex and drink and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slums because he cannot imagine what it's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased to live in the world, to live in the nightmare Instead of letting the Lord open our eyes and living this wonderful relationship with Him by our side, we have a great inheritance. You know, it's often hard to receive your inheritance if you don't know you have it. It's isn't it terrible if you have benefits, but you don't ask for them. You know, many of you people are military, they got benefits, and they don't know they have them, they don't get them. Oh, they have benefits, but... They don't receive them because they've never asked for them. They've never applied for them. They're, they're theirs, but they don't get them. Crazy. Mary uh, has gone to Mayo Clinic a number of times, and she stays in the same hotel. And then we go to other conferences and so forth. If it's available, we go to the same hotel. So Mary's gotten honors benefits from going to the same hotel. And the last time I was with her in Mayo, she says, halfway through her visit, she, said, she read this small, small print, and, hey, I'm... Starting tomorrow night, I'm an honors member. Well, what does that mean? Well, we get a, a free bottle of water in our room. Whoa! Whoa! Big time, huh? But then she went on, she read the fine print. If the motel has this certain floor for honors guests, you can get a card that the elevator brings you up to that floor and only the honored people get to go in there. Well, that sounds good. What's up there? Snacks. <laughs> Tons, unlimited snacks, sodas, cookies, fruit. Incredible. It's like heaven. <laughs> so we got our card and we went up there and we found out not only do you get all the snacks you want all day long, you can stay up there all day long and just eat them, but you get a full hot breakfast in the morning. Snacks all day and then a hot meal in the evening. I mean, this was like heaven. Do you know how much money we spend when we go, uh, you know, have to get a couple meals and pay for them in a restaurant? Now they're free. Thank you. know, as I started boohooing her benefits, oh, come on, Mary, let's just go. Now she found some great benefits. When she goes back to Mayo here in a few weeks, man, she's going to receive those benefits again, and I, I know she won't spend any money in a restaurant at all. <laughs> So don't forget about the Lord's benefits. He wants you to see his great inheritance. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. He forgives our iniquities. He heals all our diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Don't forget about your inheritance. Lord, open our eyes to see all the benefits there are in following you. It's just so wonderful. There's a man by the name of Randolph Hearst who was a great multimillionaire, and he loved collecting art. And he was reading through a magazine. He saw a picture. He said, I need this piece of art. And he told his broker, I need this piece of art. I don't care what it costs. I need this thing. He said, I'll get on it right away. For weeks, he searched the world for this piece of art looking forward to his fee for finding it, had to come back to Mr. Hurst and say, I've searched all over. It's not to be found. Years went by, and the same broker was looking over Hurst's belongings, and he had all this art that was stored in his basement, all boxed up, and he went through one of the boxes, and there was the art piece itself. <laughs> Hurst had already owned it. But he didn't remember his benefits. He didn't remember buying it years and years ago. So it is with our benefits from the Lord. He has so much for you. Receive his benefits and, and don't forget them. Another sub-point to what 
the Lord wants us to see is the power that he wants to give us. Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you can see the incomparably great power for those who believe. The Lord wants to, you to see his power, power for your life, power to see the angels around you, that if God is for you, who can be against you? I've got a, a hot pot, you know, that heats up our water, and I, I drink kava coffee in the morning, and, and uh, it's an instant coffee. Mary has instant coffee too, but hers is Starbucks, right? The Via, it's really good stuff, and it's little telling but I can't remember how many times I've gone and I've turned on that pot and I walk away and I come back and the thing is cold and I put that thing again walk away it's still cold and then I decide oh <laughs> maybe it's not plugged in what a difference it makes what it's incredible it's night and day difference if the thing is plugged in the Lord calls us to be plugged into the Lord plugged into his Holy Spirit and his power in our lives and we can play with the switch all day long, but if we're not plugged into the Lord, we're not experiencing the power the Lord has toward us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4 says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, in the heavenly realms in Christ. Isn't that crazy? The reality is that God has raised us up to be seated with him in the heavenly realms. Not when we die, but it says right now we're seated with him in the heavenly realms. So let's talk about that for a minute. Second point is the Lord wants to see you to see yourself seated with him in the heavenly realms. It's a wonderful thing. Make no mistake, reality, you are on this earth. You are on this earth. But in the spiritual dimension, you are not only on this earth, but you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And the Lord wants you to see this world through his spiritual eyes. What does it tell us? It tells us that we can live above the circumstances of this life because we're seated with Christ. Oh, we're here on this earth. We're not, you know, this is the truth. But it's just as true that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. He says it again in Ephesians 2, 6. Christ has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't say it once. He said it twice. Again, doesn't mean we're not real, that we're just walking around here. No, we are real human beings. But two things are happening simultaneously. We are on this earth, and the Lord wants us to have the perspective that we are with him in the heavenly realms, looking at our life from his viewpoint. View all of life from God's kingdom focus. You know, I love when we go flying. Isn't it fun when you fly? I love to get the, the seat right by the window, and you can look over there. And the world is just so cool down there. It's so orderly. You know, the little blocks, of you know, city blocks are just so cute and cool and cars are just so orderly, they're driving around. It's just absolutely amazing. You see the nice little football fields, cute little football fields, these little ants with helmets running around in there. It is so cool. I, I don't know about you, but I find that very peaceful. Kind of above the world. I just love looking out the window and, man, everything's so cool. I, everything's in order. I find it so peaceful. And then... The plane lands. Boom. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and your watch falls down. And anyway, the all, then it seems like all hell breaks loose, right? You get down to earth and things don't change at all. You bump your head on the thing above. You're getting your luggage. You're wrestling out. What is it with everybody running to the restroom and to the baggage claim? I mean, they got to run. They, the little guy behind you in the car, beep, 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 gets you out of the way. And we get to the carousel, and everybody's, let me in. But there's mine. There. Hey, listen, there's, no, there's nothing coming on the carousel yet. Oh, let me at it. I, I need to see mine coming through the chute. And I want you to know I'm right there with them. <laughs> that's, I want that, is that mine? No, I don't think it's mine. Joe, that's yours. No, it's not. Oh, I guess you're right, honey. It's just, and then you have traffic jams. What is it? You drive all the way to SeaTac, and it takes you just as much time as that drive, the last mile to get into the airport. I mean, it's just crazy. So nice to be up above the things of this world and 
see its orderliness and get God's perspective, get the big, big picture of things. But the beautiful truth is that Jesus is right there with me when I'm in the middle of a traffic jam and looking at the back of those red lights. And not only is Jesus with me in the traffic jam, but I am seated with him in the heavenly realms and he's embracing me and helping me and he's giving me a perspective of this world. He's opening the eyes of my heart to see things as they really are. I don't have to be frustrated with the traffic jam, but I can spend the time with Jesus, allowing him to open the eyes of my heart, to live in the heavenly realms. Jesus has enabled us to live in the heavenlies. And our, our last point, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. So the Lord has called us to open the eyes of our heart. He tells us we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies while we're still here on this earth, getting a great perspective of what this world is really all about. And he gives us the key to how we enter his kingdom. Ephesians chapter 1, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. See, you're with Jesus seated in the heavenly place, but don't forget, God has placed everything under his feet, that Jesus is the head of everything, including the church. So not only are you seated with Christ, but you're under his feet, you are under his authority. Oh, he's your best friend, but he is also your Lord. And the key to having God open our spiritual eyes to see, here's the key. What do we do to have our, our eyes opened by the Lord? It's to surrender. Surrender our lives. We're not equal with God. We're not just a little bit below the Lord. We are under his feet when it comes to who he is and who we are. And because of his grace and his mercy and his wonderful love, he has brought us up to be seated with him in the heavenlies. He opens our spiritual eyes. So may the key to your life be surrendering your life, not only one time we accept Christ, but over and over and over again. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What is your true and proper worship? Well, it's Sunday morning coming in, clapping our hands, and, and you know, singing along with the CD. That's great. That's wonderful. But you know the reality of it is? The reality is real worship is surrendering your full life to Christ. Because he is worthy. And when you do worship lifting your hands, you're surrendering to the Lord. When you do sing of his greatness, you realize you're surrendering to Jesus. Let's go on. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove God's will. His good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. See, when you fully surrender... That's when the eyes of your heart get open. That's when you realize, I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly places. It's not only having God as your friend, but as your Lord, your master, your king. What is surrender spiritually? We know what surrender is, you know, physically. Those who are in the army, we know what surrender is. You surrender, and you say, all right, I give up. That's not what it is at all. You know, when... when if someone takes you over and, you know, I think of the troops having people out and their hands are, that's not the surrender he's talking about. What does it say in the scripture? He encourages, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, viewed in, uh, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. God's not up there saying, surrender. No, but because of all the Lord has done for us. His mercy is so wonderful for us. His love is so great for us that we know it's just our proper worship to surrender our lives to the Lord. It's just reality. It's reality. And anything other than that is fantasy. 
It's a bad dream. You're not equal with God. You're way below God. But when you surrender yourself to God, He becomes your friend and becomes your Lord. And man, life is absolutely fantastic. See, it's the self-offering of your will to God. Surrender is self-offering your will to God. You see God's mercy and love in your life, you give Him absolutely everything. So what Jesus said, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If you're to follow the Lord, you don't follow the Lord saying, hey, Lord, I want my way. Matter of fact, how about you follow me for a little bit? How about we have this mutual relationship, I'll follow you a while, and then you follow me for a while. Isn't that crazy? That's a fantasy. That's a bad dream. Can you, remember, can you imagine the God of the universe following you around and doing what you do? Horrendous. Crazy. These guys really like that. <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff. But each day we deny ourselves. We surrender ourselves. We say yes to the Lord and we say no to ourself. See, we are our own worst enemy. Sometimes we think that Satan himself is our worst enemy. Nah, he, he's not as sly and slick as we think. We're our worst enemy. When we say, I know what's best, that's what James tells us. He tells us, when you're tempted and you, you sin, it's, not, it's because of your own evil desires. You're not denying yourself. You're not doing God's will, but you decided, I'm going to do it my way. Like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. The Lord calls us to deny ourselves. And take up our cross daily. It's not a one-time thing, but daily. Daily I submit to the Lord. Daily I surrender to the Lord. I'm at a crossroads and I could go my way. I could go the world's way or I could go God's way. And I deny myself daily. Take my cross and I follow the Lord Jesus. And then I'll know his will. See, above all, I think surrender is an attitude of deep, loving receptivity to God. We need to God. I don't think we had God up there, did we? <laughs> it's not just receptivity of love, but to God, that we love him. We offer ourselves not because we have to, not because we're forced to. He's not holding a gun to us. We're free to follow him or not follow him. But he gave everything for you, and that does something for your heart. That opens the, the eyes of my heart. If, if he would give everything for me, man, he deserves my love. He de deserves me to love him with all my heart and with all my mind and with all my strength and with everything that I have within me. That's real surrender. And, and lastly... The scripture tells us that really offering ourselves to the Lord is offering our hearts and minds to be transformed. It's doing it voluntarily. It's freely offering your life. He's not forcing you to do a thing. It's doing it because you love Jesus because he first loved you. And you're saying, Lord, I want you to change me. I want the old Joe out and I want the new Joe in. Filled with your spirit, living a life that's close to you, with my eyes wide open to your spiritual realm, knowing you are with me and you're helping me, knowing about all the wonderful things you've given to me, the inheritance you've given to me. That's what the Lord wants us to do. So today I encourage you not to just surrender yourself today, not to just surrender yourself, you know, whenever it was for me when I was 14 years old, the first time I surrendered my life to the Lord. But every day I need to surrender my life to the Lord. I tell you, there's one thing that I, I really loved during my sabbatical, and that was unlimited time with Jesus. There was no watch. There was no list of things I needed to do. I had to have appointments, so I only have a half an hour or an hour 
I'd get up in the morning and get my cup of coffee and start reading the word and Jesus calling and I'd go from one book to the other and I'd pray and I'd spend time with the Lord and he would speak to me and I would journal. It was just wonderful. It was wonderful. That's how God wants us to live. Offering our hearts and our minds so that he can change us and transform us. Let me read this quote quickly about uh, Bill, from Billy Graham. He says, those who are meek do not fight back at life. If you're a true follower of Jesus, you don't fight back from life, but they learn the secret of surrender or yielding to God. He then fights for us instead of filling our mind with resentment, abusing our bodies with sinfulness or damaging our soul by willfulness. Humbly give all over to God. Your conflicts will disappear. Your inner tensions will vanish. Then your life will begin to count for something. Isn't that a great line? When you totally surrender your life to Christ, then your life will count for something because you're one with the living God. You will have the feeling of belonging to life. Boredom will melt away and you will become vibrant with hope and expectation because you are meekly yielding to the Lord, and you will have this sense of inheriting the earth of all good things, which God holds in store for all those who trust him with their all. Surrender. The key to having God open the eyes of our heart, the key to true life, not a superficial spiritual life with Jesus, but a deep walking in the spirit life. Surrender. Surrendering not once in your life or twice in your life, but daily picking up your cross and falling after him. Oh, Jesus, open the eyes of our hearts. Let's stand together. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you have come into our lives. And I pray if there's anyone here today who hasn't, hasn't asked you into their life, Lord, they can do that right now. They can surrender their life to you and say, come into my life, Lord Jesus. I surrender my life to you because of your love, because of your mercy, because of what you did. And thank you that you will forgive me and take away all my sin. Lord Jesus, for those who have accepted Christ, we need to surrender. And then we need to surrender. And then we need to surrender again. We fall into sin, we get off the right path, we find ourselves hurting others, Lord, because we do our own thing, we follow our own will, but we need to say no to our will and yes to God's will. And when we do, Lord Jesus, our life really means something. What a wonderful thing that is. Our life means that we're living with the Almighty God and that is reality. We start seeing things through your perspective, Lord Jesus, and you speak to us through your word and your still small voice, and your word comes alive to us, and we have this deep and wonderful, loving relationship with you. Oh, Lord Jesus, may Northwest Community Church be a church filled with people who surrender every day, many times during the day, yielding their, their will to you. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, Jesus. We want to see you for all your goodness, your mercy, what you did for us. We want to see life through your perspective, the true and right perspective. We pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart. Let's sing it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. sing that again. I want you to surrender your life in a fresh new way today. And then driving home from church, I want you to surrender your life again. 
doing God's will. Let's sing it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, man, live the surrendered life this week, will you? Will you take this word and be a doer of it? Hide it deep in your heart. Man, it'll change and transform your life. There's an usher at the door for giving gifts to our missionaries, to the Yakima Nation, the horns. There's also the lunch afterwards for all those uh, that are welcome to that and we're going to have a great week with your eyes being open to the things of God amen have a great week